What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Danny Gavin of Optage. I'm going to formally introduce Danny in a second. Uh, before I do, Danny, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out. And this one may be near and dear to your heart. So we, I had uh, the founder of Blinds.com on, uh, Jay Steinfeld, that from scratch to over $200 million and sold to Home Depot. And we'll talk about how Danny plays into that story. Uh, you should check out Dan Grunfeld, the interview I did with him, uh, a masterpiece of a book. He talks about um, his family's journey from Auschwitz to the MBA, and it's pretty amazing. And Moise Navone of Mobileye, again, a common thread with Danny Gavin, where Moise was one of the founding engineers at Mobileye. They ended up selling for 15 point, I think $3 billion to Intel um, to fuel the autonomous vehicle. Uh, and that's not the linkage to Danny, but Moise, while he was doing Mobileye, actually um, became a rabbi, you know, and actually studied to be a rabbi while he was doing this. It's amazing. Uh, so check that out. Uh, amazing uh, episode with Moise Navone. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. And, you know, for me, Danny, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to have the people and the companies I respected, admire, and share their story with the world. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. Single, one of the single best things I've done in my life, uh, you can go to rise25.com, learn more, feel free to ask us any questions that you have there. Uh, today, we have Danny Gavin, founder of Optage, a Houston-based digital marketing agency. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Houston's C.T. Bauer College of Business, teaching master-level classes in executive education on social media, search engine marketing. If he wasn't busy enough, he also launched Odeo Academy to provide digital marketing education and practical application to the public so they can actually land a job and get a better grasp of this changing world of digital marketing that we live in. And Danny, thanks for joining me. Yeah, my pleasure. What an awesome intro. So many places to start with this. Um, why? So let's start with actually your family, um, because you know I always love the rags to uh, rags story that made something. Your parents, you know, basically started with nothing and and moved. Yeah. Um... So my parents were from South Africa originally. My mom's actually from Zimbabwe, which used to be called Rhodesia. And she had to pretty much run away from there as kind of a refugee when she was like 18, 19, 20 um, with her parents. So yeah, when my mom and dad got married, my mom's, and you know, that was like the heat of apartheid and no one really knew what was going on. And my mom's like, I just, we just need to have a better life for our kids. We don't know what's gonna happen to South Africa. So yeah, they emigrated to the United States with like, I th they say like, like $2,000 in their pocket, but really like my mom had one aunt in Houston, Texas of all places. So that's where we came, but it was, it's pretty crazy. There's like, worse always, places. So. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, um, it's crazy that they ended up here. And like, I always put myself in their shoes, like literally going halfway across the world, not knowing what to expect. It's just, it, it's mind boggling. I don't know how people do it. It is, um, you know, I guess they just want a better life. And so take me on the journey a little bit, diamonds to rabbi to MBA. Cool. So my family has been in the diamond industry for six generations. Um, I would say diamonds kind of saved us from, for me being here today, because my great grandfather, Baron Deutz, he was a diamond cutter and, and many in his family in Amsterdam. And in the 1930s, he had an opportunity to go down to South Africa in order to teach people how to cut. And while he went down to South Africa um, in Cape Town, you know, 70 of his family in Amsterdam were all, you know, killed in the Holocaust. Um, but he was there. And um, long story short, you know, my, my grandfather got married to my grandmother, which was Barnes' daughter. He also got into the business. My dad got into the business. And uh, I, when, when my dad came over to America, he was in wholesale diamonds. 
And when he got to the late, when it got to the late nineties, um, my, my mom and dad were both very instrumental just in general in thinking of new things. They saw the internet coming and they actually launched their first e-commerce site uh, in 1999, um, which is pretty cool. Very so early like on. A, very early on. Um, they actually, there's a whole story. Um, I thought, I think you'd like this. Their first, I think, online sale was a lawyer in Chicago, actually. And he was like, how do I, how do I know that this is going to happen? So he's like, I'm going to write up this. <laughs> That's contract. pretty risky, especially at that <laughs> time to buy a diamond. I mean, people were hesitating buying a t-shirt, let alone diamonds. Right. Even people now won't buy diamonds online, but the idea is, so he's like, I'm going to create this contract and, you know, I'll spend my time doing it and you guys can use it in the future with your other customers. Um, but yeah, so that, that's pretty funny. Um, and you know, I myself like seventh and eighth grade, we're talking about, you like helped build that. Oh, right. That website. So, so I mean, obviously in 99, I was in eighth grade. So I, I only got, I in, got involved in the company later, like in 2010. Um, so there's a lot that happened before me, but yes, I was definitely involved in the family business later on. Um, and yeah, so like to connect to the rabbi part. So, you know, I'm, I'm an Orthodox Jew and it's sort, in, sort of in my circles, it's very common um, that your early years, especially your college years, don't necessarily go to university to find yourself, but you go to yeshiva to find yourself and basically uh, set up the foundation for the rest of your life as due to the fact that Judaism is a big part of my life. So it's sort of like setting up what a big part of your life is going to be. And part of that is uh, rabbinical ordination. Um, so that's something that I did and really enjoyed. I actually got my ordination back in South Africa. So I went back um, there for two years and it was absolutely wonderful because I got to spend time with my grandparents and it was awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, once I got my ordination, it was like, okay, I don't want to make money off of religion. So what's next? <laughs> so um, that's where I had some really good mentors in my life. And you, you spoke about Jay Steinfeld, but um, so one of Jay's main guys who helped him get to where he was is a, is a fellow called Daniel Kotler, but you definitely should bring him on the podcast if you haven't already. And um, Daniel's like similar guy, similar background, went through yeshiva. Um, you know, afterwards he, he got his MBA from Rice University and so on and so forth. Wonderful career. Um, but he was someone I always looked up to and I'm like, okay, I'm leaving yeshiva, similar concept. Let me go get my MBA. So I couldn't get into Rice University but um, I got into the University of Houston and that was sort of my pathway into like, I would say the real world. Um, but yeah, I'll stop there. If, if you Why not questions. diamonds? And I mean, there's like, the reason I find this interesting is because especially in this world that we live in, there's a lot of career changes, you know, and you kind of have these options and opportunities and follow these paths, but it kind of leads in different directions. So I'm wondering at that point, you could say, listen, I'm going to go into the family business. I'm going to go into diamonds. I'm not saying it's an easy path, but it's, uh, you know, it's there. Why did you decide not to, and again, I could see how an MBA in business applies to that, to that. So why didn't you decide to go that route? I guess number one, education is really important to me, um, especially back then. Um, you know, I, I think there's always, you know, not everyone's like this, but I, I don't know. I just wanted to kind of build my own experiences and see what I wanted to do. And it happens to be that when I graduated in 2010, like you think you get an MBA and you get, you're going to get this job at a big corporation and six figure salary. And to me, that was like it, like making it like, I'm going to be in like Exxon Mobil shell, you know? Um, and it never happened. So when I, when I left, um, you know, when I, after I got my MBA, so, so two things, and then we can kind of go back, but so I actually ended up going into the family business. Right. Um, but on the side, with help of like people like Jay Steinfeld, who you mentioned, started building my consultancy and my digital marketing. So I was very, I don't want to say privileged, but the fact that I could work in, in the family business and my parents seeing like, you know, this is not like, we want to give you the freedom to also explore other things. So I was able to kind of play both worlds a little bit in the beginning. So yeah, that's kind of how it started. How did Jay then play into your role as the agency? Sure. So while I was in, um, so while I was studying my MBA, there's a, a, it's really important to get a good internship between your first and second years. It's known. Um, so I was looking for something and I was speaking to Daniel, right? Daniel was the CMO at blinds at the time. And Daniel was like, you know, Hey, um, you know, we're looking for some help, competitive research, different things like that. 
I would love to bring you on as an intern, a summer intern at blinds.com. And at that time, it, you know, they were on top, you know, at, on top of like a strip mall, not as big as they were, but it was a wonderful opportunity. I was there for three months and really got to learn all the different parts of the marketing department and also added value as well. But my main deliverable was an in-depth competitive um, insight research report between all the competitors and blinds.com. And I got to present that to Jay directly, the CEO at the time. And it's cool because like your little 20 year old intern and you don't necessarily have, you know, it's like, I could have just been there doing nothing. But the cool part about Jay is he really cared about everyone. And even like the intern who was there just there for a couple of months. And I guess we just clicked. And honestly, like after, you know, you know, I really wanted a job there full time, um, but it didn't work out, but that's fine. And so, you know, a couple of months later, Jay starts sending people my way. Like people speak to Jay, hey Jay, you know, you're in the mark, you're in the marketing, you're an e-com, like who can someone help me? And Jay was like, I know this really cool young guy, Danny Gavin, um, you know, you should check him out. And the crazy thing is I got a lead from Jay a couple months ago. So we're talking about 10, 12 years later, Jay's still sending people my way. And uh, so that what a wonderful relationship that we created just from an internship, you know? What was the evolution of your services when, you know, what you were, doing then uh, is probably a little bit different from what you're doing now. Oh yeah. So back then I was a single man consultancy and really helping people, you know, with little website projects as I was getting more into SEO kind of, you know, SEO. Um, I, I was also focusing on some analytics integrations, getting people to understand analytics better. So that was then, right. Now, when we fast forward 12 years later, um, we're talking about a full on digital marketing agency <clears throat> with um, between full and, you know, contractors, almost 20 people. So it's like it's a different world. Right. So now I'm not necessarily the one who's doing the work. Um, now, there are still projects and things that I do do personally, but now it's more about how am I building a business, uh, growing people in their careers and you know, handling this crazy machine. You know, Danny, we were talking before we hit record about some of the things that are top of mind, one of which is the agency, growing the agency, um, scaling agency. For agency owners listening, what are some of the things that you have found have been helpful as far as scaling and growing your agency? Sure. So first one would be delegation. And I know that that's like obvious, but it's not. Man, it's so hard when you're in the chair and you're so used to doing things like the bookkeeping and actually being in client meetings and things like that. It's so difficult to see a world where someone else is doing it. And when you figure that out and like jump, that's how you can start to grow. Uh, part of that is a realization that when you do hand something off, it's never going to be 100% the way that you want it. And kind of understanding it will be 80%. Right. Um, but sometimes 80% is enough. And that's how you're going to grow and make more room to do things. So I, I know it sounds like an easy thing, but man, when you're sitting in the chair and saying, like, what? I, I, there's no way someone else could do this. Um, I'm having that, that, that hard time now for even my employees, because think about it as people go up in the organization, they also need to delegate. And that's kind of how we get successful. And it's hard. Like, it's taken one of my, you know, my guy, the head of paid social to do some serious delegation, it's taken a couple months to feel comfortable just to do hand off things that only he could do, at least in his mind, I'm the only one who could do it. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you about how do you help them flex that muscle of delegation, but what was the hardest thing for you to relinquish? You know, like I'm never gonna hand this off and then you end up doing it. Ooh. You know, it's funny, I'm going to change that question a bit, but like what, one of the hardest things to relinquish that I haven't done yet, <laughs> um, I'm still doing the bookkeeping. And I know that sounds crazy. Um, and I like was on a call yesterday with a CFO because I'm right now I'm shopping CFOs because I'm looking for some, you know, additional insights and things. And he's like, what? You're running that type of company and you're doing that? So even me, I've got things to, to, to work on. But um, I, I would say client meetings because... To me, it was like the only way we could be successful is if I'm in every meeting and I'm the face. Because when they signed up, they want Danny Gavin, right? And if I'm not there, how's it going to work out? But honestly, that if if I Danny Gavin is shouldn't be an individual, it should be what I stand for and the quality. And if that's in 
my team who are like my brothers and sisters. So then it's the same thing, but to get there, very difficult. Like literally like, it's like ripping off band-aids each time. Like, no, Danny, you're not going to that meeting. No, you're not going to that meeting. You know, Danny, I was talking with a friend, Duncan uh, Olney, who runs Fire, Firebelly Marketing about this exact same topic yesterday. And we were talking about this. How do you help staff who are used to doing the work and as they move up in the ranks need to delegate, flex that delegation muscle? What do you do with that? That person, like you were mentioning, is like, okay, I know you used to run this. Now it's time to manage and have some leadership. So I would say three things. Number one is you have to lead by example, right? If I'm not doing it, then why should they do it? I mean, that's with everything. So it's hard to be on the top, but that's number one. Number two is sometimes you need to get them help, which is like, whether it's some mentorship or coaching, just to help them work through it. And sometimes it's good to have like a third party, not you, because that way it's not like personal, but it's from an object, objective perspective. You know, everyone needs coaches in their lives and sometimes that can help. And the third thing is just like, it's like, it's, it's, it's like an equation. Like you, you only have this amount of time. We've got more projects coming in. We can't split you. So what do we do? And sometimes it's just got to click like, okay, I, I get it. Like, so, okay, what can I do? Well, we could fire clients or we could hand this off to this person or not. You don't have to hand off the whole project, but you know, there's like 20 tasks. You can do 10 of them and someone else can do 10. Mm. So it kind of just gets to that point. But once again, you can take, you can take the horse to the water. You can't make him drink. Like usually what happens, it, you know, some people get it right away. Others it's like they, they get so pressed that the only way to do it is, okay, now I realize I've got to delegate. So the goal is not to get them to a point where they're stressed out. <laughs> yeah, like, like I don't want them to like realize, yeah. oh, like now you got to do it. But with some people- It's a good, it's, a, it's listen, it's a force function, right? So I mean, that is one way you can do it actually as you just, it, you're forced to. If you, if the person has too much that they need to do, then it's, it's gonna, it's gotta happen, right? So I, I like that. Um, actually. But um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about a couple cases. We can kind of learn a little bit about what you do and, and how you think about marketing. And there was one um, with a, a plumbing company. Yeah. So we work with a plumbing call, company called Nix Plumbing. And, you know, it's funny. Most of the leads that we get are referral based, but this one actually came through LinkedIn for a while had like this kind of like marketplace where people would send requests and respond. So responded and we won the business, which was really cool. Um, kind of like out of the ordinary. And it happened in the middle of COVID um, 2020. I remember they really wanted an in-person me meeting. And in like May of 2020 to go into an in-person meeting, it just, but remember we're in Texas. So I'm sitting there at the table. I got my mask on, you know, um, it, it was just interesting, but yeah. So I've been, I went to Texas during the middle of the pandemic, actually. So it was a little bit different from Chicago, put it that way. Much different. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, they were looking for, you know, they were working with someone on their SEO and on their website. And I guess it just was kind of stagnant and they didn't see what, you know, what they're going in. The interesting thing is, is when I was look, looking at, like initially looking at the project, they, they actually ranked really well for a lot of terms. So it's hard for me sometimes when someone comes to me and says, we're not happy when I'm looking at it, like, mm, that's not that bad, you know? Um, but it's just an interesting point. But, but past that, they had a website that was HTML based. They couldn't, there was no CMS. There was no way for them to actually update things. And in general, you know, they just wanted to increase their business. So in this specific scenario, we wanted to con convert their website into a WordPress website. But with me, site migrations are always so crazy. And it's funny, a lot of people come to me for it. But the reason for that is, is that like, yes, it's a bad website, but you know what? It, it helped you accomplish all this. So now to take this, uproot it, rebuild it. And, you know, the big thing of why people come to us is SEO migration. How do we take that value that that website has and move it over to this new one? It's always like, it's so risky. I'm always very conservative in those cases where it's like, maybe you shouldn't, right? But in this case, we didn't have a choice. We had to move it because for their business needs. Um, and thank God we were able to 
build a new website, transfer over all that equity that they had. And over time, with additional SEO efforts, and now we do a whole bunch of things for them. We do paid search. Um, and we were able to literally double their leads. Um, they're extremely happy. And they're like one of my largest clients, um, just solely going through building relationships, doing things well, and showing results. You mentioned you know, site migration. There's a lot of things that can go wrong and maybe things that people don't think about. What is a big mistake people do make that you see when they, because you may take over something after someone's already built a site and migrated it. What are some big mistakes people make with that, that site migration? Yeah, great, great question. So the, the easy one, like the first one is you, when you're going to migrate a site, usually the URL structures are going to change. Not always, right? But often they will. Um, and you may remove pages. So number one, it's so important that you set up redirects and where if someone visits the old URL, they automatically get transferred to the new page. <clears throat> so that's extremely important because imagine you have all this equity build up on these pages and if suddenly they disappear and you haven't transferred that over i think that it's like a pipe it's sort of like you have all this water coming into your house imagine taking a chainsaw and cutting that off right before it gets to the house that water is not getting into the house it's literally going on the floor all over the place and that's the idea so that's really number one number two would be some of the structural elements like header tags or text on images. These are things you don't think about where maybe the content is exactly the same, mm. but the way that the tagging is set up on the back end is different. That suddenly changes exactly how the site looks. So that's a number two. And then I would add a third point when it comes to migrations is linking. When you go ahead and you're changing the structure and it, let's say there used to be a link to this page from the homepage. And there used to be internal linking is an extremely important part of SEO that helps Google, number one, understand the value of the pages to you, right? Because if in your own website, you have more links to a page, they understand that's more important. And also the use of anchor text, the actual text that you use for those links gives Google a better idea of what page is about. So if you mess with that internal linking structure, even with everything else being okay, that can also cause major issues. Hmm. The, I, I want to, you know, that's a B2C example. I want to talk about B2B example. And this is a really interesting company uh, with BrainCheck. Yeah. So BrainCheck is a really cool startup. Um, they came up uh, or sort of developed a software um, basically on an iPad uh, to where they had like a, a baseline of normal, let's say brain function. And then as you take these games or tests, they're able to tell how far off you are. Originally, I think they created it for concussions. So imagine like there's, you know, a kid at school, he's playing football and he gets hit. We don't know if, is he concussed or not? Pull him to the side, you know, quickly take the test and see if there's a problem. That kind of moved more into figuring out better diagnosing dementia and Alzheimer's for older people. Um, and that's kind of where they've more gone. They've done great big tests with big hospital systems and thank God they're doing very well. Um, but they're, they're, so why they come to us was obviously to build up their leads. Now, typically when you talk about the healthcare and medical system, you, you, you look at um, pharmaceutical reps as a good example, right? Pfizer reps. My, my father-in-law is a doctor and I, I know my, my wife as a kid, she grew up with all these like cool free things. Like, that the, that the reps would come over and, you know, and bring all these free, you know, swag. Um, so that's typically how you think selling to doctors is like literally going door to door. So coming along and saying, no, the way we're going to reach doctors is through digital marketing, both, you know, and remember there's two types of digital marketing. There's digital marketing where people are proactively look, looking for things. And then there's also, then there's second interrupting people where it's like, okay, I know you'd be very interested in this product, but you're not necessarily looking for it. So to go to that extreme now where they're not even looking for it, but to introduce them to the concept and start to open their eyes and actually sell to them, pretty crazy, right? Um, but that's why they came to us to create a, a marketing funnel or a system to get more leads and to get doctors who are interested in the product. 
You know, Danny, one of the things you have to do with your clients um, is you really have to identify who is their ideal avatar because you're spending a lot of time, energy, and money to target these, uh, you know, I guess personas, right? So talk, talk to me about the process of with brain check specifically, who, who were you looking? Cause I could see this going in a million different directions. Like right? you could say family practitioner as well, uh, dementia clinics, hospitals. So talk about your discovery process and how you break down. Cause I think this is important for any business to really identify who are their ideal clients. How do you walk a company like that through this exercise and come out the other side with, cause at some point you got to, focus on someone. Yeah. And I'm going to take it one step further, but especially in B2B where there's not always one buyer, right? There's more than one decision maker. You even have to think even more, but yeah, but the idea is, so when we talk about customer persona or avatar building, one has to sit down and think about who, who are we selling to? Um, and like in this case, is it the doctor themselves? Is it the practice manager? Um, if it's a hospital system, there may be additional layers of certain things or who can decide who's gonna pay for what, like a purchasing department. Maybe even you have to consider IT, right? Like if this is an actual IT thing, do they need to know about it as well? And when you sit down and you sort of create those people and like in marketing, in marketing 101, when we like create avatars, we always make like these cool names like Dr. Danny or purchasing Pam, things to kind of remember of who the different avatars are. And you figure out like how old they are, what they like, what do they read, what, what speaks to them? Like, what are their problems? What are you trying to solve? And when you create these personas, um, then you have an idea of who they are and how they tick. And now you literally, I think of it as like, have that paper in front of you. And then as you go write the blog post or you create the campaign, you're really looking at them and thinking about them and then what you're going to try to, to accomplish. Okay, so this is exactly who I'm looking for. All right, let's see how can I target them. Or when I write an article, what angle do I need to take? Um, what, you know, what's actually bothering the doctor rather than what's bothering the purchasing man manager? So, uh, so <clears throat> that's really how like the foundation before you start marketing is like that customer persona development. And like I said, what's really important specifically in a case of B2B when you have multiple decision makers, you have to realize who are the ones that I have to target and the messaging may be a little bit different, right? What, what the doctor is looking for isn't necessarily what the purchasing manager is for or the practice manager, right? Um, you know, the doctor might be more like, okay, how can I serve people better? The practice manager is like, okay, how do I make more money? Like, how can I reimburse, how can I get reimbursed by insurance more by using this thing? And then that's gonna be what your ads are different, right? Um, how it, one ad is about a guide, a reimbursement guide, the, the guide to reimbursing for, you know, whatever, and how you could create a additional hundred thousand dollars in your practice. And for the doctor, it might be, you know, the latest tool, which really have helped people, um, you know, to better or case. And there may be an IT person that is like, well, how are we going to integrate this? You know, you see back-to-back -back patients all day. How are we going to make this easy and integrate it in the practice? Exactly. You got it. Um, you know, I, thanks for having that conversation. Because I think it's one of the most important things anyone could do in their business. And I talk to people who have a hard enough time niching down, let alone identifying a specific avatar. Um, so I appreciate you going into that. And what's interesting, you have the ODO Academy. And you start, I don't know if it's still this way, but you start off with the really unique niche. I don't know if you meant to do this, but but talk about that. Yeah. So. Coming with Audio Academy, it was like, you know, another digital marketing course. <laughs> so because there's tons out there and there's free ones out there, right? So obviously there's reasons why you want to come to mine and you want to pay me for it. And it's really good. But um, you know what it was? I, I, I found someone who runs a very, um, a very profitable course and she teaches people how to copyright. And, and it's called Copy, Copy Tribe. Her name is Michal Eiskowitz. She's also a good person to interview. And I was I've sitting with her. i copywriters on the podcast. So, yeah. Super. And so with Michal, like I literally sitting, sitting down with her and just to get ideas about the course, I actually paid her for a time to sit down. And man, like 
she she reaches out her main target is orthodox jewish women and i'm like wow that that's a that's a really good idea like because when you think about it when we talk about digital marketing and especially now it's such a there's so many avenues you could be a freelancer you could work for an agency you can work from home um in digital marketing itself, there's the more analytical things, there's the more creative side. So it just, it felt perfect for someone who often has to provide a second income, but also has children and needs something. Sometimes a lot of children. Right, sometimes a lot of children. And, and to, to, to kind of have a career and something that they're gonna be good at. And so, so many of these ladies are so smart. It's like, man, this makes sense. So. For those who aren't familiar for the you know orthodox um jewish world in general and this is not for everyone but for a lot of people like being in a mixed classroom would be a little bit uncomfortable so to go ahead and create a woman mixed only you mean gender i meant by gender gender yes so so to have a women's only cohort um for them is is a lot more um comfortable and not strange you know a foreign environment and and that's really the, the niche that we went down in and it's worked tremendous. So I want to unpack this for a second. Okay. Cause she said sure. Orthodox Jewish women and you said, this is great. So I want to understand why you said that, because I think people have problems niching down in general. When I think of that, some people may say, well, listen, Jewish people are 1% of the population. Now we're talking about Orthodox Jewish people. And now we're talking of half of that, which is women do you want to give me a smaller segment to really market to here? So why did you say, oh, that's a good idea? Cool. So first of all, looking at myself, right? So I'm Orthodox um, and I am a professor at the university. So in that culture, I'm already sort of more accepted, right? So, wow, this is a rabbi. He's religious, but he's also very educated. So naturally, I've got more of an affinity to that audience and that audience can, can appreciate me. Um, in addition, and I know this sounds kind of funny, but in order to get to that audience, I, it, I can get to them a little bit differently. I can actually put an ad in a paper magazine, right? In a magazine itself, and people are going to be reading that magazine and see that ad and be interested. So I don't know. It's just, it's different. It just felt like, it felt like it could work. And I mean, a lot of companies, yeah, I asked that just to, to poke yeah, at no, you no, a little good. bit, but it's good. Um, but a lot of really successful companies start off with a small niche. Like I interviewed the founder of RX Bar, right? Now they started in a like a very in the CrossFit community and then they had rabid fans and then it grew from there. So there's a lot of companies, and, and this is, you know, your course isn't a mass market product, um, but it is. I think one of the selling points of your course is not just the information, but some people have actually gotten jobs. Like it's going out and actually applying it to jobs, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, the goal is like, I, it's funny because one of my students said, Danny, your course is like Netflix, right? Like, I can't wait to watch the next video, which is really cool. But yeah, like I, I, it's not just about watching a bunch of videos, but it's actually, we have homework assignments so you actually have to take what you learned and apply it. That homework assignment is graded. We give you feedback. And then at the end of the course, we have a final project where you are required to take everything that you learned and actually apply it to real life business. So you create a portfolio that you can, like you said, actually get a job. So I, yes, it's only 15 weeks, but I try to stick in like a years of experience into that. So yes, if someone's expecting to hire a five years of experience, that's not gonna be one of my students. But if someone's looking for smart entry level, who's got some good experience, these, you know, my students are ripe for the picking. Talk about selling the course, right? Having a course, people think it's, you know, you build it and they will come, which is not the case. And selling the course where there's, you know, there's features and benefits. And, um, you know, there's obviously features to the courses you have, but you do a good job, I think, because I listened to a couple other uh videos where you're talking about the course, selling the benefits of it. So when you went out to market to sell this thing and fill this thing, what did you do? So obviously I would say there is a primary event that usually occurs, which is like a webinar. 
And at that webinar, um, I've invited other people who are, let's like, ideally, if you could do that webinar together with like an influencer who could bring their own audience, like that's great. And then the idea is that in this webinar, I want to teach people about the digital marketing world in general. What is it? What's available? How much money do you make? And so on and so forth. And therefore, if you stop there, you've just learned a lot about the digital marketing world and these options. And then obviously I turned that into more, okay, now that you hear this, this is a great way how you can get into it. So that like that event itself, driving people to that event and then afterwards following up with them is really important because just to go to someone and say, hey, buy a $2,500 course, buy a $3,500 course, that's hard, right? But if you can get them to more of a soft event where they learn more about it and, ah, now I see what you're talking about, and then bring them along, um, you, you will be a lot more successful. I mean, when you think about it just in general with marketing, like we have marketing funnels, right? Most people are at the top, aren't ready to purchase. So how do you move them along the funnel so that they learn more, understand, and then they're ready? Because, ah, now I get it. I, if I don't, I'm going to be miss, miss, missing on something. Yeah. It's also the, what you're saying is not an impulse purchase. It's not like a $99 course. It's a kind of a done with you type of situation. And one thing that when I was researching this about you, it's you do a really good job hitting the pain points and then hitting the results. So you're hitting the pain points of that. And it goes back to where you really structured and, and you know, your, your persona of the customer so that you're speaking to their individual pain points. They may, like you said, they want a side income or whatever that, you know, whatever they're looking for. And then you're giving that result to them specifically with the course. So um, I love and, that. And, Jer and Jeremy, to add on to that. So like, so yeah, if you go to the Audio Academy website and you go to the landing page that we created, there, there was a lot of research done to that and, and um, figuring out and interviewing people and speaking to them, like what they need. And yeah, so Sometimes you think you're just slapping up a page, but to create a true page that speaks to someone and then really solves their issues, it takes a lot of time, money, and insight to do that. It's not just like, okay, let's create a landing page in a day. You know, I was talking to a friend, Ian Garlic, you know, who you know also, who introduced us. Um, big shout out to him and his video case story. So if you need a case story uh, for your best customers, contact him. He's done ours. He's amazing. Um, the, he basically introduced you. You do service, you do SEO, you do websites, but he also specifically mentioned LinkedIn. And sometimes LinkedIn is a black box for people um, doing LinkedIn paid. Talk about some of the mistakes people make when they're navigating the LinkedIn world in, in paid. Sure. So when it comes to LinkedIn ads, we're all very aware that the targeting is awesome, right? Because when on people on their LinkedIn profile put so much information. So really, if I'm in a B2B world um, and I'm trying to target people, it's great. But then the problem is, okay, if the targeting is so great, how come when I run LinkedIn ads, <laughs> the results aren't great, right? Um, so for a while, it's a years ago, Another thing was like, I'm used to going to Google ads and seeing cost per clicks being a dollar too. LinkedIn cost per clicks are five, $10. And for some people that's, that's a lot, right? That's a huge difference. So I feel like that's also pushed people away. But the, the key I would say for LinkedIn ads where, where like sort of the success lies, num number one is where we found a lot of success is when you're first reaching out to someone, you have to think of about two things. When someone is scrolling on their feed in LinkedIn, they're, they're not ready to buy at all. Like people aren't on there to, to try out new services. It's really about education, entertainment, the next job, what's inspiration. And therefore it's hard as a business, we want to sell to people right away. But, but in on LinkedIn, especially, your first interaction with someone has to be more soft. It's like dating before you get married. And yes, sometimes that costs more money, right? Oh my gosh, we you got to take her out five times to that restaurant. What are you talking about? Right. But yes, that's just how the platform works. So that's number one. 
Number so two, then you recommend oh, sorry, driving them to a piece of content instead of, or what is your recommendation there? Yeah. So to actually actualize it, we, we refer to it some sort of collateral. So that could be a case study. It could be a guide. It could be even a video. It could be a webinar, an on-demand webinar, something where someone is willing to give you their information, their email, their phone number in, in, in exchange for a piece of content that they find that will be valuable and useful. Got it. Uh, yeah. And, and, and then the second quick thing is, is that when you, for some crazy reason, when you send people away from LinkedIn to a landing page, I don't know why it, it's just, it's hard for them to fill it out, to fill out those, those forms. So LinkedIn has created something called a LinkedIn lead form where the form exists on LinkedIn itself. And the nice thing is that when you fill it out, it's pre-filled with all your information and that works really, really well. Now, other people could, I know there's other people say, don't use lead forms because it's too easy and maybe they're not going to be high quality. But honestly, like what I've seen is that when we send people to the landing page, the cost per lead skyrockets. And if you don't, you, now you could do that maybe later on down the funnel, like someone who's opened your form and you know, they've read it. And then, you know, then where your messaging is more about selling, that might be okay. But at that first spot, yeah. I mean, think about it. Your clicks are like $10. When they I would think there, you want to make it easy. Why, why do you want to create friction at that point? I agree with you, but mm. there are lots of people who don't do it. Yeah. I mean, I guess, like you said, it's all a test, right? And you're like, you're seeing conversions higher with, doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what I think, it matters what the data <laughs> says. And exactly. if the data is saying, okay, people are filling it out and it's better, it, it, that's what it's saying. So um, first of all, Danny, I want to thank you. And I want to point people towards where they can learn more. Uh, you know, I know people can go to Optige, uh, O-P-T-I-D-G-E.com, learn more about what you do. And where can they check out Odeo Academy? Yeah, so odeoacademy.com. O-D-E-O Academy.com. First of all, Danny, any other places we should point people online to learn more? Yeah, um, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter. So LinkedIn, you can get to my profile by going to dannygavin.me. And Twitter, my handle is at Danny Gavin and would love to speak to anyone and help where I can. Awesome. Everyone check it out. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 